I was asked to share thoughts and I didn't think Gary had learnt yet that it's dangerous to let me have the mic. <laughs> um, reading this feels like there's a challenge to our culture that you don't just accept what has always been happening, your traditions and your culture and meeting Jesus might require us to look differently at what's always been our status quo and accepting a gift that is bigger than we realise. Um, so I'll just start reading and see if that's what anybody else takes from this as well as what Gary's got to add. <coughs> After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethsaida, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame and paralysed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going down, going another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. That was a very nice summary um, up front. I thought it uh, really captured it. The man who is invalid meets Jesus. It's really a wonderful um, picture. And I, I like what this passage um, it does because so far we've gone through um, three at least of meeting Jesus and each one is different. But this time... It, it starts by coming out wide and uh, just like um, the song that we had uh, previously, Come to the Altar, and, and it's as though uh, this, is, this is the focal point. This is the place where I want you to beam your attention, this, this altar, as Steve has been saying about, you know, coming and leaving stuff at the foot of the cross. Here is a picture where Jesus is... Uh, coming into the world but it's it's not to the cross he's actually coming to where the people are if you can imagine I like those um, TV shows or the way in which they start and they're really they're out broad and it's like having a look at the whole of the earth you know from outer space and it just beams and it comes down slower and slower and slower and slower until it it focuses on a country and you can see the oceans around and continents and then you're down into countries and then it's in a particular place like you're almost beaming down onto a city. This is what it feels like for the opening of this paragraph. And uh, as, as it beams down on this um, small place called Jerusalem, it, there's contrasts in there. Have a look what it says. Jesus went up to, the, to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsedra, and is surrounded by five covered colonnades. 
there's a contrast because Jesus is come into Jerusalem for a festival. And festivals, Jewish ones, are to mark out times when things have been special uh, for Jewish, where Jewish people have recognised that God has actually acted. And it could be uh, one that's based around um, Esther and the saving of the Jews while they were in um, captivity. It could be coming out of Egypt. It doesn't specify, but they're usually feasts about some time that God has acted in a special way that had transported um, people into a new position. And But it says that he's come for a festival and he's in there and there's this place called the Sheep Gate and there's a pool next to it. And the Sheep Gate's on the northern side and uh, there is a pool. They've unearthed it, they've found it and it's about 100 feet long, uh, divided into two and it, like it says, sheep would come in through this gate and they would wash the sheep in one section of the pool. And so it focuses now not just on the festival but a contrast because the place or the pool is called Besedra, which basically means the place of mercy, a house of mercy. And yet the description is like this. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. Can you see the contrast that he's giving us? That all of a sudden, he, Jesus comes to, for a festival, but he goes out of his way to find this section in the city where it's called the house of mercy, and it actually looks like a house of misery. But then even then, like, the focus is not just out wide still on all these people, a like large number of disabled people, but now it focuses on one particular one. Verse 5. One who had been there, invalid, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learnt that he'd been in this condition for a long time, so he's found him, he's focused on him. He almost is the epitome of those people who are there. I'm stuck here, he'll been here for a long time. Put your hands up, guys, who's been here the longest? Jesus finds out this guy has been here for 38 years. And as he is, it almost uh, epitomises the whole idea of in hope, I am here in hope that one day... Life will change for me. Isn't that where we sometimes end up? At some stage, I am persevering here in hope that one day in the house of mercy, life will change for me. So Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well? I mean, I find this passage is full of, oh, that seems such an awkward question. And yet Jesus seems to ask always in our meeting with him the right kind of question. Do you want to get well? You are hoping, you're sitting here hoping for change, but do you actually want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied I have no one to help me I have no one to help me it's interesting because he actually doesn't answer the question I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in somebody goes down ahead of me I am not well because I have a reason. And sometimes when you do speak to people and they tell you their condition, but they never actually tell you that they actually want to get well. 
Sam was mentioning uh, about some people in Lifeline and, and certainly uh, sometimes at school when you're talking to uh, students, there are some, I would like to rehearse my story for you. I have comfort in my story, my sad story. It actually brings me a little bit of significance because nobody suffers like I do. Or maybe it'd be turning around is that I, I'm almost offended by what you say, Jesus, in that do I want to get well? Because I want to answer you and tell you I am not well because of others haven't been here to help me. And we have that blinding fact that you can turn around and you can be there and blame other people for the condition you're in. The surprising thing is that the details of our story says, well, somebody must have brought you there and somebody must pick you up at night. Have you pushed away so many people in telling your story that there is no longer anybody here to help? who wants to stay with you. We get so used to the place that we're in that we actually don't want to change. I certainly was like that um, for many years where I didn't even believe that I could actually have a different condition like for my skin disease. That I thought, this is, this is it. This is life. Don't even bother asking or pray any longer about changing my condition. I can live with it. What surprises me is that at that point where this guy answers, there is no one here to help me, that Jesus doesn't turn around and lecture him about having gratefulness in his life. Well, somebody came and dropped you here off, mate. Or turn around and say to him, you need more resilience. Jesus seems to know what it is that he needs. And every person that Jesus meets, he treats differently. And I find that spectacular. I find that really precious. Because I struggle with the idea that all I need is this formula. All I need is this pattern. And then this is going to happen. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't turn around and lecture the guy. Nicodemus, he tells him, you know, Nicodemus makes that uh, thing, we can see that you're a teacher. We can see that. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. If you want to see, you need to be born again. Um, Woman beside the well, you've come here to draw water. There's better water. And he leads her through a totally different conversation than Nicodemus. And now he comes to this guy and he's doing something totally different. There's a beautiful passage in Ephesians 1, 8 to 9. And it says, with all wisdom and understanding, he makes known to us the gospel. He like he knows and understands where every single one of you are. And I know what it is that you need. I don't make random sort of guesses as to your problem. You have um, specialists, psychologists and stuff, and, um, and they're always writing up papers and coming up with new acronyms for different kinds of conditions that we have. We are complex but messy. That's what it means. And so no one thing fits. And so Jesus meets this guy and he comes away with, I know what it is that you need. One of the wonderful things um, that he does is he says, I know that you're messy and I know that we all have sin. We are complex to one another, but not complex towards Jesus. Jesus doesn't see us as being complex. We struggle with one another. 
and work out that I don't understand why this is working that way. And it's beautiful. So Jesus this time simply says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. In response to his answer, there is somebody here to help you. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he does. The guy stands up and then he goes picks up his mat and walks. And it says like I almost want the word off. He walks off. Because he picks up his mat and he walks. And then they, there's another little twist in the story. There's another little complication. The day on which it took place is a Sabbath. The day in which it takes place is a Sabbath. And so he's going on and there's this other element. Is this a problem? The day that it's a Sabbath, is that going to be a problem for my healing? And it's funny because it, it actually does. It becomes a hindrance, a barrier to him to being healed. <laughs> It's almost as though we've lost the significance of coming into the rest of Jesus. A regulation that is for our benefit now becomes a hindrance to our healing. And it's coming through the Jewish leaders. They want to call him to account for breaking the Sabbath. And so they speak to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Can you see the irony in that? Uh, I'm up, I'm walking. The, the, blokes, the bloke who I met, who made me well and has restored my legs, that guy, he told me to pick up my mat and walk. What do I do? And they're going, the law forbids you to carry your mat. Get the picture. It's, it's ironic. I'm walking and I'm not allowed to carry my mat. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up it and walk. And he says, the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. I, I have no idea who it is, this bloke who told me to pick up my mat, but I've got it. He's made me well, and I have no idea. This is my little disclaimer. I think I'm allowed to carry my mat because he said so. But uh, in case that gets me into trouble, you should really be speaking to him and not to me. It, it's almost like um, I'll own the healing, but I've got a little white flag here. I surrender. I really don't know who I stand for. I've got a choice here, grace that's been given to him, healing that's been given to him has now transformed his situation and he has to make a choice. What choice am I going to make? Am I going to stand with uh, these guys who say I can't carry this or am I going to stand with the guy who says I can? Who will I stand with? It's a choice that he needs to make and that's what grace does. Grace puts us into a difficult position because now I have to find out who I'm actually going to listen to. I suppose in one way I need to answer the question as to whether or not is Sabbath day rulings something I need to follow? Is that something that I need to address? Because somebody will oppose you when Jesus says, I'm allowed to carry my mat 
because I'm a well now. I'm now allowed to carry it. So what am I going to do with this rule that God has ordained and these guys are pressing me to do? Paul, in his letters, in Corinthians, says, one person considers one day special, another person considers it every day alike. Each does so to the Lord. In Acts 15, when they uh, come in together and the Jewish um, people who had become Christians said, we need to make everybody follow the law. We need to do that. Okay, yes, believe in Jesus, but they'll need to follow the law. And so they sit down in Acts 15 and it was recorded, what should they do with it? And so they write a letter and um, they said, Peter says, I, I don't, uh, our ancestors weren't able to keep the law. So how can we make them try and keep the law that we couldn't keep? and that Jesus died for. So let's write a letter. It's not a command, it's a courtesy. It's a courtesy, we will be courteous, we will understand that these things really, some things offend them and they gave four things for them to do. But rest is found in the work of Jesus. And he needs this guy has a choice as to whether or not he will stand on Jesus and do what he has told him to do. There's a tension, though, for the guy, a huge tension. One of the things, I still, I'm kind of picturing he's still got his mat. The man, <clears throat> who is this man who told you to pick it up? The man says, I don't know. Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. He gets away, you know, like, I mean, how does somebody do that? I mean, you're thankful to the doctor who, who might give you some tablets and you go away and you come back and you say, gee, that was good, thank you. Um, but here is a, here's a guy who lets Jesus get away on him and he doesn't track him down and doesn't even find out his name. And then in this passage, there is no praising of God for the miracle that's right in front of him. It's like everything just continues on. It's just totally transferred to another place. And so it says, later, Jesus found him in the temple. The tension is, who do I follow? Or will I stay with those who question me? I've got a choice of staying with somebody who heals me or somebody who's going to question me. Why would they then have such trouble with Jesus? Why is it so hard for him to choose Jesus and to follow Jesus? One of the things that said in the beginning of John's Gospel, they were not going to recognise Jesus as an applausible authority. These guys will always oppose you. There is not a plausible authority that Jesus has. So he's faced with these men who are teachers of the law. They're visible, they're audible, and they're confrontational. However, Jesus, he seems small and invisible and quiet, yet he makes me walk. That is the kind of choice that you have in following Jesus. Because the voices around you who say you cannot carry your mat for whatever reason, or you can't do this in school, or you can't do that, etc., is going, are going to be people who are visible in your face. They're going to be audible, and they're going to be confrontational. And, and the, the thing I know that has always frightened me uh, challenge me whether it's been in scripture class or uh, in the shop is that I face these people who are ordinary people who are those three things and yet I look at my God and my Jesus that I want to follow and he is small and I can't see him and he's quiet 
and yet he has helped me to talk. Jesus meets the man in the temple. Before, like, he meets the man in the house of mercy, now he meets him in a house of worship. The contrast is there for a reason. And it's funny that the man is now being in the house of mercy and now he's in a house where there's worship and prayer going on. And guess what? He hard, his heart hasn't changed. He's no different. Whether he's looking for mercy or whether he's looking in worship, he can sing the songs that they sing at the temple. They can be there down praying on their knees and giving sacrifice. But it doesn't change his heart. Look what happens. Jesus says to him while he's in the temple, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. There is something that the temple is not going to change your heart. Being in McDonald's isn't going to make you a hamburger. Being here will not change your heart. It is a choice as to whether you follow him. Listen to his voice. The guy hears Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. What does he do? Well, for starters, I find it interesting that when he says it, it's a personal word to him. Jesus will give you a personal word. I always find it interesting that in a, in a message there is time when uh, somebody will pick a phrase out of what has been said or what's been sung or a testimony that's given. And, and for another person it's missed. Jesus will have a personal word to you and it'll be a powerful word and it'll be a revealing word but it's also a sobering word. It seems that he doesn't like being rebuked. He doesn't like being questioned. It's like as soon as the teachers of the law question him, I'm out of here. I'll, I'll surrender. Yeah. And then when it turns around to him being in the temple and Jesus having a quiet word to him, he's doing the opposite. He's, also, he's now running towards these teachers of the law and saying, hey, it's Jesus. I don't like being rebuked. I don't like being told I'm wrong. I don't like time, being time to be corrected. And so he's out of there. So what does it mean for us? How do we apply it? What do we see in, uh, in here for us? I see three questions. First one, it, it, this one begs the question, why does he not stay with Jesus? Now that he's walked, see that you are well again. Like you know what it's like to be unwell and now you are well. So, are you afraid of losing your identity? Or are you afraid of exchanging your identity? I am known for this. Or is it that you're afraid of standing accountable for what's happened? I don't want to pipe up. That's difficult for me. Are you afraid of being uncomfortable of the unknown? The questions that are coming. I don't think I've got the courage to do it. I'm not sure what Jesus will do with me. I know that I went through all of those questions. It also begs another question. Why did you do it, Jesus? Don't you think it was a bit of a waste seeing that his heart isn't changed? You changed his legs, but there was far more wrong with him than just his legs. Up top, in the old paddock, it's the ruse are loose. And he's jumping whichever way seems easiest. So, Jesus, did you waste? Did you waste your grace on him? But one of the things I notice 
in if, whichever part you want to read in the Bible. You see, God in his very nature loves to create. He saw the earth and it was void and dark and chaos was over it and he turns it into something that he says, this is beautiful. It is the very nature of God and I put it to you, it's the nature of you as well. Inside of you, you have that same likeness of God. For some of you, turn around and go ahead and study things I would never study and you are passionate about it. Whether or not it's um, you're a nurse and you like drawing blood out of people and, and to see and you go ahead and do it because it is something that's needed and I want to see you get well or whether or not it's moving furniture into people's house so that they can turn it into a home and you can do that all day or whether or not you go ahead and start study geomorphic stuff um, and, and go ahead and spend weeks at a time studying uh, animals in a desert out in where nobody else lives and you do that with some passion you see, you believe in what you do to change things. God is like that. God is like that. So I don't know how people make music. I have no idea how they do that. But they love that and they take symbols and make beautiful sounds. We have passion. God has a passion to change chaos into order. And not only that, it says that God does it with love, for he loves the world. He not only, why would you do it, Jesus? Because you see our misery and you say over and over again, I have compassion on these people. That's why I would do it. Is grace wasted? No. No. Because straight after this, it opens up a door for Jesus to speak about his mission. It also reveals his character. Because what he starts healing, he brings healing to completion. He wants to bring us to perfection. It also begs a personal question. Where are you? Where are you in your journey? Are you still waiting to be healed? Are you still stating where you are at? Have you dealt with Jesus? Have you made a claim to stand with Jesus? And do you struggle to trust him to carry it on to completion? There's three things I want you to recognise out of this passage. First is to recognise Jesus, that he loves you and he is the one who helps you. The second thing is confession. Confess what you are afraid of. Each one, each time that Jesus comes to a different person, you have Nicodemus, he turns around and he says, I have no idea what you're talking about, Jesus. You're Israel's teacher and you have no idea? How do you call yourself a teacher? It's like, ooh, that hurt. Or the woman at the well. Go and get your husband. I have no husband. Yeah, because you had half a dozen. And there's probably a busload parked down the road. There is... <laughs> Face your fear. Will you bring it to Jesus? What are you afraid of? Will you surrender your story? I learnt that um, this week. Um, I have a story that I would tell myself over and over again and I had a son who told me, stop telling the story. I had a wife who told me, stop telling the story, stop making up excuses and confess and then leave it at the cross. Choose to follow him. You don't want to know why? Because we're all invalids. The whole lot of us. We're a whole bunch of invalids. I'm going to um, read out a prayer and if you want to follow it uh, in your own heart and mind, that's great. But I'll read it out first. 
Lord, I surrender my mess to you. Lord, hear my cry for mercy. Heal my brokenness through your power and grace and give me courage to stand in Jesus Christ and to walk in the newness of life. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you'd like to pray that prayer, um, I'm going to do it now. Lord, I surrender my mess to you. Lord, hear my cry for mercy. Heal my brokenness through your power and grace. Give me courage to stand in Jesus Christ and to walk in the newness of your life. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to come to... Um, communion now.